it's a little bit after nine, and I don't. I know it's Monday, and uh, you guys are, are probably all a little tired. But uh, should we wait a few more minutes, or go ahead and get started? Yeah, I think we should also get started. Um, yeah, what I wanted to talk to you uh, today uh, is about uh, classical force fields, and um, and actually we're going to touch on at least three varieties of these force fields today. Uh, there's coarse grained, full atom, and sort of hybrid methods where you combine components of, say, of these more coarse grains with a full atom simulation. Of course, most of the work in terms of the force field development has been done in the area of these full atom simulations. But I'd like to point out it really does depend on the problem and that you're trying to solve and what are the time scales and what are the length scales that you're having to deal with. So for example, if your goal is to do structure prediction and, and look at, say, the kinetics of protein folding like myself, uh, those are time scales that, you know, go into the millisecond and maybe I can, you know, deal with this more coarse grain energy function if my goal is just to produce a structure at the end of it. Same way, uh, you're going to see later on this week a talk from Mike Klein where he does membrane simulations. Uh, those can also be done full atom, but if you want to start looking at problems of like protein insertion into a membrane, then maybe to just get a feel for the problem, uh, you have to resort to coarse grain methods. Um, so as I say, each of these, you have to look at your problem, and as I said, each of these problem has a different goal and, and a different time uh, scale to it. And the goal that you're attempting to reach, that's going to also help you in the development of the force field that you're going to need for that particular approach. Right? It'll be evident as we go through, because we'll w use words like training set, test set, optimization rules, but there'll be a sort of a analogous step no matter which of these methods that you use. Okay, so as I said, the general uh, considerations we have to make are if I, if I use one of those three methods, what's going to be the description of the molecule that I have in there? Well, full atom is pretty clear. You're going to use all the atoms. But in the others, you'll use something a little bit more simple. Um, and this just sort of repeats the things I said before. So again, be aware that there's going to be like a, a training set where you're going to learn how to develop your force field, a test set, okay? And last but not least, I guess I guess it really uh, uh, stress this last point. Each of them will have limitations, and so that'll mean like if you're going to do s certain hybrid uh, methods, then there are questions that you shouldn't be asking. Same way, if you're going to do full atom simulations, then maybe there are time scales that you should not be going into with those. Right. All right. So now I'll start off the talk with a, just sort of a quick overview of. Uh, one of these coarse grain methods, the uh, field of protein structure prediction has really motivated this entire field. One of the things we want to be able to do is take those sequences that are just being churned out uh, by the minute practically and turn them into structures and, or, and help also with being able to annotate uh, genomic databases. We'll talk tomorrow on the part on bioinformatics, or sort of two general approaches. One is sort of an ab initio approach, which is more what we'll talk about today, and the other one is a sequence alignment method, which is something, as, as I said, we'll get at tomorrow. Um, so now let's just take a brief look at the, a, a typical, uh, or at least my energy function, for ab initio folding. Well, as I warned you, the first thing you're going to do with these coarse grain methods is you're going to change the description of the molecule. It's a very reduced description of a protein, which you see at the bottom. That's it? Okay. Um, yeah, as you can see here on the bottom, this would be like a typical uh, uh, protein backbone. And we're only actually, in our dynamic equations, only going to consider three atoms, the C alpha, the C betas, and the oxygens. And because we do that, then we even have to change the form of the backbone uh, potential. 
because you don't have all the atoms, you have to build in extra terms that guarantee you getting chirality. Correct. Um, you can, uh, you also put in potentials that allow you to sample the uh, Ramachandran space correctly. And what I'll look at next are the type of interaction terms that we're going to have between residues, say C betas and C betas and C alphas and C alphas. And that's rather unique to our method. Uh, we use what is called a, like associative memory Hamiltonian and a contact potential. And the associative memory Hamiltonian, that is being used at sort of things that are short to uh, medium range and separation in the, in the sequence. And what you're trying to do there is to associate similar structures and with sequences that are sort of known in these database of proteins, which we call here NU. So if you look, this is just sort of a Gaussian that tries to move your new coordinates close to typical ones that are seen for those pair in, others, in other molecules. Now, instead of putting here the amino acid, we put here just a property, because oftentimes it is, is sufficient not to use the full 20 amino acid code in doing structure prediction. You can really get away with projecting them down, say, to four or five different atom types. And this has also been verified by pe ex people experimentally that you can build proteins have the same function but with a reduced set of amino acids. Um, at the longer range, what you do is you go in and you look and you've calculated the pair uh, distribution function and you just be sure that your potential sort of give you the right behavior, say, between hydrophobic, hydrophilic groups at these large distances. Now, in both of these energy functions are sitting weights, you know, the parameters that have to be determined, uh, optimized, and you're going to optimize those, you're going to learn what they are by using this energy function on sort of a known set of proteins, the so-called training set. And the motivation of our particular optimization, uh, optimization rule comes from a whole approach that I term energy landscape theory. It was developed uh, uh, with my colleagues uh, Jose Onacek and Peter Walnes. Um, as in essentially, we try to design an energy function that would smooth out the folding funnel for any one protein. And we, the way we try to do that is we look at the distribution of the uh, misfolded states. Uh, and this is essentially Gaussian. And then we look at the distribution of native-like proteins. And we try to change those parameters gamma so that we get the maximum discrimination here. And that discrimination actually is, for us, is the dimensionless ratio. Other people who use like perceptron theory are just trying to make sure that this gap is positive. And if you want more details of how this is done, I can refer you to a review article in the Reviews of an, uh, Physical Chemistry. One of the things that you have to do is now that you've developed this energy function is, you know, look at the results that you get at it, look at the energy landscapes. Is indeed your energies, are they funneled, uh, say, to the correct structure? Q here is just the fraction of native uh, contacts that are correct. So uh, a structure that's the native one would be one, something to completely unfolded would be zero out here. And if you look, there are three curves here. The top one is called a go, so called go potential. And here we really put in the answer. We only calculate those interactions on those contacts that we know exist in the native state. So that should be the fastest funneled. Here's one from the training set. Because um, if I go back now, um, which is here, we said we optimized these ratio over an ensemble of folds. So you just don't take one protein to do this. Although maybe if you're in doing design, you may want to do that. What are the parameters that are particular for that protein? Instead, you'd want to take a whole ensemble. And people have already done studies. What are the most frequent folds that you see in any, any of the genomes? So you'll do the may, oh, maybe over 100 to 200 molecules are in this training set here. Then here's something outside of the training set. And it looks actually fairly well funneled to uh, down to about 0.6, but then it gets very rough here. And that's a trouble with most of these coarse grain methods. There's a certain amount of degeneracy that really pops in, and you have a variety of solutions that are allowed out here in the so-called native state basin. Uh, that was the energy. These are the free energy curves. You can see sort of the same thing. 
The absolute test of this, the, the ultimate train or test protein, is most of us who are in the structure prediction area have to participate in the contest that's called CAS5, CASP. And these are the results from the latest one that were just announced in December. And this is one of the ab initio results. And I guess the, the blue is the NMR structure that was given to us uh, in, in December. In, sep in the summer, they give you the sequence and you have to produce a structure. In December, they hand you, hand you out the structure. And the gold, uh, or orange, I guess here, uh, is our prediction. As you can see, the global RMSD on this structure is about 2.6 uh, angstroms, not too bad. Um, and to give you a feel for how we're doing, we're the dark blue and light blue, you're allowed to hand in more than one suggestion, and this is the rest of the 200 participants that are there. And another way of looking at results, which is very useful, is, is to construct what are called contact maps, where you plot both the sequence here and here, and if two residues are within a contact which you specify, you draw a point. And we've put one on one side, the NMR structure, one side, the, uh, our predicted structure. And if we did an absolutely perfect prediction, these two parts should look symmetric. And you can see we're off here at the, uh, I think it's the C terminus or N terminus end. There's a little bit bigger blow up. This is, of course, our best one. I didn't, uh, I'll show you some of the ones that weren't so good, perhaps tomorrow. And now, just to give you a feel of what sort of value of Q that we want to achieve, um, is the studies have been made that if you have a Q that's a greater than about 0.4, you'll be able to annotate um, structures uh, well, that you can assign it to maybe a functional group. Uh, or Q uh, is defined right down here. It's just the number of pairs, and it's Q is the fraction of native contacts. So that's our goal. Now, for these coarse grain models, I should tell you that right now they're really only doing well for rather small proteins, things under like about 100, and, 100 to say to 120. Um, as you go up to bigger in size, you have to use other methods, uh, and normally you break it up into parts to, to be able to achieve any type of success. Now, as we move on and ask questions, now I'm not worried about structure prediction you know, a structure is fine, and I've optimized uh, that, those energy functions by, you know, maximizing some discrimination value where I look at all the native X-ray structures. That's one criteria. As I move into the area of trying to look at mechanistic problems, I better move to a more detailed description if I want to ask more detailed questions. And this is going to be the subject, this molecule is going to be the subject of your tutorial this afternoon. Um, it's, uh, it's one of the molecules, one of the enzymes that appears in the histidine biosynthesis. Uh, it's in a very important step. Uh, histidine is an essential amino acid. There are, it takes several steps to make it. The one that you're going to look at is this fifth step. And the reason I say it's important, it does two things. Uh, first of all, with the first substrate, the glutamine, which is what you're going to be dealing with, uh, it comes attached to the protein. Um, it, the, it hydrolyzes in, in, upon this attachment, and the ammonia that comes off actually becomes the nitrogen in the ring of the histidine that's made. The uh, other product here becomes in one of the precursors for nucleotide uh, synthesis. So as I said, it's a very uh, essential and critical point in this, um, in this pathway. Here's a little bit of a schematic of what's going on in that fifth step. And there's a lot of things going on. And in fact, you'll, in studying this whole biosynthetic uh, pathway, this is the work of my student, Romeo Amaro, which will show you a little movie on this to go along with your tutorial at the end of the talks today. Um, you're going to be studying primarily this attachment here of the glutamine, say, into the active site of his H. Uh, afterwards, there will take place this hydrolysis. It'll give off the glutamate. It'll wander out. The ammonia will and we've shown can go through the barrel of this protein. This is work that's just coming out in PNES, um, sort of the first calculation that verified that you can use the barrel of this ubiquitous fold to sort of direct intermediates in a reaction. And then uh, the other substrate, which you won't deal with, is this PARFAR down here, and that's the one that gives you off the next step in the bi histidine biosynthesis and the precursor for the nucleotide synthesis. 
In addition to those sort of chemical, chemistry problems, when it would be great if we had like a QMMM code just ready to, to roar and you could uh, also look at this in, in several different approaches, there's an, an, an additional docking problem that also has to be addressed here. How do these guys get close to one another? How do they orient? And a lot of these problems can be assisted in using bioinformatics and we'll see again some of that tomorrow. So they said in, the pro, uh, in your tutorial what you're going to be dealing with is this glutamine coming in uh, to the active site. Uh, oops. Uh, yeah. Into the active site, there's a cysteine and a histidine at this active site. It's going to become attached and the ammonia will drift off and then go through the his H, his F, excuse me. And so we're going to try and build this. And if you do this, you're going to know just immediately that's not in the standard force fields. And as I, we said in the tutorial, this happens to everybody. You can do simulations for a long time and not run into something that is uh, not in those classical force fields, but it occasionally does happen. And then you're faced with, if you're going to continue to use charm or amber or one of those sort of class one force fields, you've got to know how they were parameterized so that you do a similar good job in developing uh, your parameters to do your simulation. Um, this just tells you what I've already told you, that, that it has an active site, and you'll see that later in the, uh, in the tutorial. Now, your choice of, of simulations um, involves, uh, or at least the most common uh, choices that you'll face are the so-called class one um, energy function, and these class one, class two, class three are not indicating, you know, you know, better, best, or worst, or whatever. Uh, they're just their general uh, makeup and the form of the energy function that's used in them. So charm and amber, OPLS, GROMOS, are, are have rather simple energy functions. These class two ones, that's the Merck force field and the universal force field. They have actually just many more terms. These have maybe been optimized on 200 um, uh, compounds. These will typically be uh, optimized on 700, maybe 1,000 compounds. Um, and then, of course, there's the ongoing work that, that Todd mentioned to you on Friday of trying to use these QMMM methods where you can actually get in and look at the reactive chemistry. He said, we're going to break it down into like we're going to assume it's attached and now uh, use it uh, to sort of judge the quality of our assigning uh, the, the parameters to this new non-standard amino acid. Now, it's very important that whatever one of these methods that you're using, that you go to the website that is responsible for it. And so like uh, the late Professor Coleman's group takes care of Amber, um, Martin Karplis and his colleagues take care of Charm, Although one of the two main, the, the two uh, sort of uh, heroes in this area of like application as well as uh, uh, leadership in the user group are sitting in uh, adjacent offices in, in scripts. And in fact, at one time they were even having the same programmer making changes in this one as in this in, and in this force field. So, uh, but it's very important you check their website to see how they parameterize things, if there have been any changes and just take a look at the literature, right? And they're very friendly people and uh, they'll tell you how to submit even uh, changes or make additions to these force fields because they would of course love to have the community grow, grow larger and larger and when you do something that you feel that could be shared by the rest of the people, you should really communicate it to them. And they have a method of putting it into uh, sort of a, a file that's available to everybody until they do the next release. Now, here are the class one uh, force fields. Um, there are you know, these typical harmonic terms for the bonds and for the angles. Uh, there is a, uh, these are for the dihedral torsional terms. Uh, there's for impropers and your Bradley ones that are for um, like one, three uh, interactions. This term is not there in the charm, that's why, uh, is not there, excuse me, in amber, that's why I put it in blue. These take care of what I call all the local or bonded interactions. And then you have the non-bonded terms, the electrostatics and the van der Waals terms. And each of these has parameters, force constant, equilibrium positions that have to be determined. 
And if you put in something new, some new chromophore, some new pigment, some non-standard amino acid, you're going to have to develop these. Now here are the class two force fields. As you see, as I promised, there are many more terms. And mostly it's like, okay, here's the quadratic one, but there's also cubic and quartic terms. And because of more terms, they've also been fitted to more things. And the, in the jargon uh, of the field, they have what are called greater transferability. Uh, in other words, you'll always find an answer here. Whether it's exactly the right one, you have to still check, right? But these are typically the force fields that are used, say, by organic chemists that they want to do like uh, these combinatorical studies, a lot of fast throughput, don't want to have to worry and stop about adjusting the parameters for each step. You can try to use these. I'm not sure, but I don't think these are implemented in the, to the present version of NAMD. They are only running the class one uh, force fields. Now, let's just discuss uh, very briefly uh, these typical interactions in uh, the local interactions. And again, as I said, these are bond stretches. There'll be uh, bond angle vibrations, and there'll be torsions, say, around this. Those are involved four atoms. And uh, another thing I should uh, uh, mention, and oftentimes you'll be asked in setting up your files, whether it be with NAMD or we have a little bit uh, more user-friendly interface on Mo. Um, that you can see the force field terms and you're asked whether you want to scale the one for interactions because uh, you also have electrostatic interactions between these two and depending on how you parameterize these things, uh, it may be necessary to scale these interactions. Any residues that are separated uh, larger than, uh, than four, uh, there's no scaling that's done, say, on the uh, uh, dihedrals or the Van der Waals. Now, uh, here are the, some typical values, um, and most of the data that I'm going to show you, I've just taken off the website of um, Macrell. He's the fellow who's in charge of uh, doing the parameter releases for, for CHARM, and he has uh, two articles that appeared in uh, uh, Journal of Computational Chemistry the year 2000 and a more recent one, 2002, plus he made his uh, sort of notes on how to do this available to you. So I've taken most of this data here, and you'll see his name on the bottom of uh, these slides. So if you want to go back and check and have a uh, look at a more detailed discussion, I refer you back to his webpage, and it's also cited in the tutorial. So again, um, these are typical values that you see, the bond energies and typical bond distances. Hopefully you saw those in your exercise on Friday. Um, so like for a typical CC bond, it's 1.5. Then as you get to tighter bonds, it's a single and double, uh, uh, double and triple bonds, it shortens. Uh, and from the, if you had this potential here, you could fit uh, the um, force constants to them. Uh, you were able to just get them out of the quantum chemistry cal uh, calculation of the normal modes, then projected them all onto one axis or into one bond, and then you determine the force constants. Um, here are the periodic uh, dihedral terms. These are, uh, N is the periodicity, and uh, delta is the phase. These are all for phase equal to zero. So this is just like for N equal one, two, three. And we've assigned different force constants to those things so you could uh, see them a little bit more clearly. And again, the range of these things, though, is, you know, of 10 to 20 kcal. The impropers are just, are used mostly to keep things planar, uh, uh, keep this hydrogen, say, in the plane of the, of the, of the benzene ring, and the Ewer Bradley takes care of these one, two, three uh, interactions. Uh, the non-bonded, or what McCrell calls the intermolecular uh, parameters, you have the electrostatic, and you see that it involves charges here, so we have to worry now about those, what charges should I be using there? How about the Mulliken ones that you calculated yesterday, or ESP, or do I have to do a restriction on those and do RS, uh, RS, uh, RESP, RESP charges? And again, things are a little bit confusing because it turns out CHARM actually starts with the Mulliken charges, whereas CHARM, uh, whereas AMBER uses uh, all the ESP and the RESP charges. Um, this is just a definition of the terms that are coming in here. These are these 
uh, uh, radii that are involved in the closest uh, approach in the van der Waals interactions, and they're normally just taken as the, oh, there should be a div division by two here. Uh, they're sort of presented and stored in all these databases on an individual atom basis, and if you want to know it between two atoms, I and J, you use those terms divided by two. And the, um, and the energies here are the geometric means. Uh, here's the typical electrostatic terms between a positive and negative, and then two negative terms. Um, again, we've already addressed this issue. You're going to have to decide on the partial charges, so you're going to have to know which ones are being used in the particular, data, uh, particular force field you're going to use. As I said, these are for amber. This is the starting point for, for charm. Um, here are the letter Jones potentials, and so here's this minimum distance, and here this energy epsilon. And again, this just summarizes to get a feel for the energies we're talking about. These bonds, uh, the covalent bond uh, stretches are in the hundreds, of, say 200 kcal. These are in the 10 to 20, and these are oftentimes the torsionals, and you will calculate the ones involving a torsion uh, uh, that has a methyl group rotation. Those are typically less than a, less than a kcal. Now, having just discuss sort of these just general principles, what are we going to do with these force fields? Where are you going to put them and in, into and solve the Newton's equations of motion? And this week you're also going to learn a little bit about the numerical analysis that goes involved in being able to do that efficiently. And out of the, that motion, you're going to make inferences and assign energies to particular conformations, uh, to the motions, and you're going to use that as the basis of your interpretation of mechanism and function and what's going on in the system. So if you don't want to have junk coming out, then you better not put junk going in. So it's worth learning about how these force fields were parameterized. And depending on the question that you're trying to answer, uh, and what the goal of your calculation, that's going to really determine just how much effort you're going to put into this whole procedure. So again, let me just go back to some general statements about the parameter optimization. Um, you can do a minimal job. And that just means like, okay, uh, I draw something. If that particular compound is not in the force field, um, or, uh, maybe I can sort of uh, have initial guesses by analogy. I go in and I take a look, well, are there any, um, in our case, we're going to have a sulfur there. Are there any sulfur compounds? And what are they typically bound to? Maybe I can use those as an initial assignment. And again, you'll be using Mo in the tutorial to help you do that. It's very good at telling you, no, this thing's not there in the, in the charm or the AMBER database. But what you can do uh, is I find a lot of other cases and I'll sort of guess for you. And this is my initial assignment. It's very quick. It's very tempting just to stop there. But you, it, depending on what you want to do with this, if you're just trying to do like uh, maybe a database screening. If you're an organic chemist, that's just fine. Um, and as long as it looks, you know, fairly reasonable or perhaps you use one of the other force fields, even the, the, the Merck force field. But if you're trying to really do mechanistic uh, studies or perhaps get at free energy calculations, then it's worth going back and spending a little bit more time of going, of moving towards this maximum uh, optimization. Now, you probably won't be able to do the uh, as good a job as they have been able to do in developing the force field, say am amber and charm, because there they've had a lot of time, and they've got uh, many compounds which they uh, that they've studied. They've done all the full quantum chemistry calculations on them. They have gathered up all the experimental data that they could, but and we'll review what it is that they do and actually what they did in going from 22 to 27, so you can get a feel of what type of things that you should have at hand if you're going to try and do a little bit better job of, uh, of the parameterization of, uh, of a new quantity going into one of these force fields. So we're going to be doing here in the manual uh, uh, side of uh, the fitting procedure. As I said, in charm and amber, they have this more automated and they have a lot bigger uh, data set of things to set up the parameters. What's interesting, though, uh, just this point, I think as, we, as more and more structures are developed and as we become a bit more systematic with uh, storing our vibrational Raman 
um, heat capacities, results like NIST, um, which is uh, online and accessible to, to everyone, uh, has been attempting to put uh, like a lot of this information and have it be stored. I think we really can slowly move to having this being more automated so it's not such a problem. But right now you still need to check. So even just doing things by analogy, trying to use parameters that are there, existing already in the, in the database for sort of analogous or somewhat analogous uh, structures um, still needs to be tested. So <clears throat> this is so-called the roadmap that they used to go uh, to develop the CHARM 27 that came out in uh, the year 2000. Um, um, most of this, as I said, is based on the article that was written by McCrell at that time. There's actually a series of articles. First they did the force fields, and uh, the primary thing that happened in going from 22 to 27, there was a major improvement uh, in their treatment of nucleic acids. I think they found that with their previous parameterization, they weren't getting the right equilibrium populations of A and B forms of DNA. And there was another component that came into it, particularly this last step. Most of the parameterization is being done on small -er model compounds that are easy to do the full quantum chemistry. I think you heard from Todd last time, but 300 is, Adams is like a real major achievement in a full ab initio simulation. Most people don't, they don't do that. It'll be, you know, around 100, say, to 200 atoms. Um, so in uh, taking those parameters and applying them to macromolecules like DNA, they noticed that the, there needed to be one more round of iteration put into this whole procedure. So now in the final test step, this was one of the newer things that came in, they actually test these things over some trusted examples of larger uh, sections of DNA and nucleic acids to do one last improvement on the parameters. So what I've attempted to do this uh, with this is I put more or less his roadmap and annotated a few of the things on the side here. And you can see that there's a lot of work that has to go in in doing this procedure. One involves you have to have a lot of experimental data. As I said, all X-ray structures, NMR structures, IR. And from that, alone from that information, you can start getting a good feel for the statistical variation you should be seeing in any of these procedures or in any of the parameters that you come up with. Uh, to check, say, particularly the Leonard Jones um, parameters, you need to have information on heat of vaporization, sublimation, um, things that you can use there. I should point out, um, maybe I did it over here, uh, sort of to go along with this parameter development uh, of the Leonard Jones and the uh, uh, partial atomic charges that you're going to be assigning. You will do, and they typically do, a sort of this hartree fock 631G star. And I know you don't all remember what that was from, from Friday, but let's just say it's one of those quantum chemistry calculations with a particular set of basis sets allows a certain degree of, uh, of uh, polarization to take place. Um, all of these parameters were fitted for the tip three. So if you're going to go off and, and try to do simulations in methanol and other solvents, uh, the first thing I would do is uh, contact the people of these groups. Amber does have some more flexibility in being able to treat other solvents, but the CHARM people uh, have uh, said very clearly that their parameters have been developed for the TIP3 uh, that's out there. Now, for these trusted model compounds, uh, they have done um, an, an MP2 uh, calculation on them, and from those they make all, uh, and, and along with the x-ray data, they have all the information they need to look, say, at dihedral barriers, bonds, force constants, uh, and th the reason they've chosen these model compounds is because this calculation agreed very well with this one. So if there are model compounds that don't agree, they're not in their test set, right? And then I cannot stress enough that you may, if, even if you go through here, you'll probably have to go through here at least twice because there's some, you change something on this step, it'll affect something here and you'll have to do it at least once or twice to get self-consistency. And then as we'll have you do in the exercise, you have to put it into the condensed phase, 
do a simulation, take a look at it. Does it agree now with this still? Then you know you've signed all your force constants correctly and all your equilibrium geometries correctly. So how do you get started with this? And as I said, getting started typically means um, you try to identify any previously parameterized uh, compounds in the, the, the force fields. Uh, you look at their topology files, um, and you try to assign uh, atom types that agree with things that's, that you can find uh, in the existing set. Uh, you have to describe your new molecule, your new compound, by giving it the conductivity and assigning some charges. And if you make any changes, or if you're building something, or if you've assumed I'm basing this charge on this compound that's in char uh, charm, it's very important that you annotate your changes. Because this is the only way that you can really go back and sort of uh, uh, even explain what you're doing when you're writing a publication, how you came about with these things. But it also it helps you to be sure that you're not having to change too much in doing in any of these steps. Now, these are the number of topology files that are out there. They have ones separately for lipids, for nucleic acids, proteins, and combined. And you really have to read the small print to see what the, the difference is sometimes between a one that has proteins, nucleic acids, and one that doesn't. And oftentimes it just means that they're at various stages of optimization of the parameters. Like, as I said, if they move slowly over from going from only small molecule and experimental data to bigger systems, uh, those values have been reparameterized. So you have to read the small print here that's on McCrell's website. So what I wanted to go through uh, with you in the, in the next part of the, uh, the, the talk was uh, just how to develop parameters, say, for this compound. And it is a, a somewhat large compound, and so typically what you do with any of these things is you try to break it up into three smaller components and work with those, particularly if you see those in the uh, existing parameter file. Um, uh, I put a little statement down here. I don't know if you all can read this. Of course, you do have the problem of going back and putting these things together and building this next one, but there are some basic rules that you can use to do this. So like typically, if you're uh, trying to add things on, you had a methyl group, and now you wanted to connect that to the next unit, then you take the hydrogen off, and you'd put the charge of the hydrogen onto the carbon, put them together. Um, but anytime you do things like this, you do have to go back uh, and check them. Now, the rest of the talk, we'll just be going through parts of this and also showing you sort of the typical uh, mistakes that, that people can make and until we get into the, the hybrid. But there is uh, a sort of a natural uh, place to either, as with a big talk, take a break now uh, for, and let you guys have a few discussions, or I can launch into the next part of the, the, the talk. So should we make a quick pause and, and I can answer any of your questions we have before we get into this? I know it's a little dry, but it's one of those necessary evils uh, that you have to go through. Uh, and the bigger the community is, the less in any one of us is going to have to, to, to do on this problem. So are there any questions so far? Um, why don't we start in the back? Um, uh, actually, if you go to the easily, you know, uh, there is a way to do it. As I said, the, the one of the biggest differences you see is that uh, they, they don't have this Dewey Bradley term. But they, this question has been asked so often <coughs> that if you go to the Amber and the Charm webpage, there is a little link that says how to transfer um, charges. Again, I think there are some benchmarks on that. They are fairly so 
similar. Um, there used to be the greatest differences were in the nucleic acids. And uh, I'm not an expert on this. I just, I, I think people felt uh, that to get more consistent results with amyl, that we should have COM27. Now, uh, in these called Coleman, uh, it's not even that, but very equivalent. Uh, and and, and I, as I say, I told you this one story, because uh, I was on the, um, an NIH panel that reviewed GRIP, and it was the very industry that the main developer of COM attributed to, in the next office, to the guy who's the main developer for Amber. And, and so we asked him, well, how do you guys update these things? And they said, well, it's just better. And they even had hired the same programmer um, <laughs> to, uh, to make changes. And they just said in a sort of an offhand and joking way that I think uh, within a few years, we'll probably see them becoming even more and more similar. Now, the Jury Bradley terms Oh, in, in important for some things are not, you know, they're not even there for all of us, uh, a lot of things. So I think it is going to be becoming more and more similar. And again, I think on your web, web page, I know there is a benchmark application that was more on, I think, on just running uh, the COM and, uh, and some different platforms. I think also Amber is a, a different platform, so those are probably some of the different things. But but they're very comparable. And you're asking an important question because, you know, if you're writing a paper, you have to do what is um, uh, state of the art. I mean, I've always promised I'll get some, a reviewer, he'll look and say, are you using one of the tested uh, methods? And like some of these other methods may be very good in getting a fast answer <coughs> and doing ranking, but you can't go ask the detailed questions because you're not allowed to people to come through. So you do have, and it has to be rhetorically simple because it shows you these answers. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't wear the mic because I don't have any pockets. Um, um, he was asking a question. Okay, if the class ones are designed for like uh, uh, bigger molecules and uh, like the Merck force fields and the class two, well, this is about as far as I get, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so he was asking, okay, if the organic, uh, if like the Merck force fields are designed to do organic molecules and the other ones are designed to do big molecules, how can I have the little molecules interacting with the big molecules? What force field do I use there? And that's a good question. And uh, I do know that um, I, I think both the uh, amber as well as the charm, the most recent amber and charm force fields feel that they have uh, uh, got that problem uh, under control, like for protein DNA, protein nucleic acids, because that was also in some of their test cases. What is less clear, and I just don't know the data uh, at all, is that we know that when you're doing a lot of cancer research, they're interested in not so much the protein uh, DNA, um, uh, RNA interactions, they're trying to put a drug in there to block it. So you're coming right up and facing this problem. But I think now that there's enough information of how you can parameterize that, uh, those uh, small organic compounds, you don't have to go use the, the Merck. You can use that to get started, get an idea what to do. But if you're not trying to do high throughput, uh, once you've done your high throughput drug analysis, let's put it this way, this is what I would recommend, and located a few compounds, then I would try to do a more detailed treatment of the organic ones that's consistent with the amber or charm force fields that are out there. Um, what? Okay. Um, ah, there's so many of you now. There were only four before. Okay. Uh, you're in the middle? What is the expiration time? Oh. Hmm. 
Okay. I didn't. I thought somehow you guys may have heard about this in, in the, some of the previous other uh, um, talks because I think you did a simulation in water, right? Already you solvated things. All right, there are various models, of course, that you can use for water. You can imagine tip three, there had been a tip two, and there is now a tip four, and I believe a tip five even that are out there. And um, it's just a particular uh, description of the water. It has uh, the partial charges located on the atoms. Some of the other ones, uh, the higher ones, have tried to put in, uh, you know, uh, the to allow the effects of polarizability in, and they'll put in uh, interaction sites that are not located on the individual atoms, tip four. So uh, for the, the charm, as I said, they have said they have used the ch tip three model, which has been widely used and accepted. Like there was an article, I think, in the cover of Science or Nature, they were able to use the tip three water molecule and get water to freeze. It was a major... Uh, achievement and get the right properties. But if you want to look at polarizability effects and subtle changes, these other ones are out there. And as again, as I said, I think I would discuss it with them. Amber says that they have already begun their analysis to provide parameters that are for also for TIP4 and for others. But typically, if you're really interested in, like, in doing biomimetics, uh, then you have to go and perhaps even use programs I didn't even put up there like I think this one's called macro model that has parameters for methanol and typical interactions of that with organic compounds. Yes? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, um, as I said, 27 was, uh, if you read McCrell's article in the Journal of Computational Chemistry, uh, 27 was primarily addressed to really improving the nucleic acids. So I would look at the CHARM 27 nucleic acid one. They don't sit still, though, right? And so they are also working on the Leonard Jones parameters. And um, so if you have... Any doubts, uh, you just send McCrell an email and uh, of which one you should be using. But I would, for the nucleic acids, clearly the 27. Uh, for proteins, the 27 is a lot like the 22, but with some minor changes. Uh, but they're growing all the time. Okay. Another question? Uh-huh. Oh, I meant you, but it's okay. Yes? Okay, he has a question about this big molecule being broken into the three parts. So what's your question? Um, well, you know, in principle, but uh, I, I think, I, I don't really remember from his webpage, but I think this is one of their uh, 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 model compounds. And sure, you're going to calculate the charges. He's going to do a lot with this, uh, with these components here. These are definitely have already been considered. But in general, you pick the biggest molecules you can do that where you can also do well the quantum chemistry on it, and you have experimental data. So as our knowledge base grows and our quantum chemistry programs, their capabilities grow and the computers grow, you can actually pick bigger things. This is a test like I can put these things back together and create the whole compound. Right, but you know, okay, he said he's done his self some anecdotal work where he's calculated uh, what you would get on um, doing quantum mechanics on the big piece and then trying to put it together from the smaller pieces. Um, you know, but to be frank, 
you we have to work on being able to big the builder the to be able to build the bigger out of the smaller uh, parts because you just can't say well sorry I'm just not calculating anything bigger than this right I think if if you want to get insight you have to develop some techniques to do this now uh, again you know the problem is most things if you're doing the uh, quantum chemistry calculations, you can do gas phase very easily, but if you also want to start including some of the solvent effects, then you're going to have to put some waters around them. That also makes the quantum chemistry calculation a little bit more difficult. But we'll get into that into the next next part. Um, yeah, you, uh, I'm sorry. I, mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. You, you know that's, uh, that little comment I made on statistical variations that they use? Um, yes, they do look at these things typically for their training set that they have in developing the, the full parameterization. They've looked at them in various conformations. And also when you fit the dihedrals, you have to be sure that you're getting the barriers right. And one of the things you do too, that final phase in the, in the roadmap, was you do your simulation and one of the things you're looking at is, uh, is the pop are the population studies. That's what they started to do in DNA, and they noticed they weren't getting the, uh, enough of the A and the B forms. But you can also check all the dihedral angles to see if you're getting things that make sense to what is known. Uh, right. So yes, they're in there. And. Well, you know, uh, I mean, I'm not here to defend uh, 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 Charm or Amber. I'm a user like yourself, and it was this story that's the tutorial is the story of one of the students in my lab. And in fact, I'm hoping that as, as you guys uh, maybe can even help, uh, we, uh, we'll do even more calculations on them and get a, even a, a greater uh, statistical uh, study of this. You know, there's always, uh, even though it is, looks like it's uh, fully automated, there are some scaling things that are done. And as I said, you really have to read the fine print. Like, in, and I noticed in one article they were scaling the sort of the quantum chemistry results because they're dealing with the tip three. They scaled by something like maybe 1.16 and someplace else the number was slightly different. So I think that you have to, um, uh, there is still some human intervention in there that could be possible. But, you know, I think you have to ask yourself what is, uh, what are the variations that are, are allowed? And, like, if, if it's, if we're talking about, you know, greater than a, a tenth of an angstrom in the distances, maybe I'd start, you know, worrying. You want to be under 0.1. And same way with the angles. Uh, with the barriers, they intentionally We'll lower them because I think their feeling is they would rather sample more space than less. Right? Well, Friday, no. Uh, Friday had vibrations. And you have to go and generate, like you'll do today, the potential energy map of the, you'll have to do what we call a dihedral drive and turn it uh, to get those out of there. <laughs> yeah, I need some water. penalty for asking a question is you all have to listen to the answer. Okay, you had a question? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. Uh-huh.
Um, let's start with the last question. Um, is that force field available in NAMDI? Now to, uh, and again, I have never worked on a silica surface, but uh, uh, I do know that, the, you know, CHARM is also, there's an academic uh, group, and then there's one that goes through what I think it's called a, a Celeris or MSI. They do have a package for bio, for, for material science. And people have been in, um, uh, using their force fields that are in there that have been parameterized for typical surfaces. I think, uh, I know silica is in there. Um, someone who did, I think, a calculation on uh, buckyballs, some of the things were also in there. So I would say you should go take a look at uh, what's available through there. So that does mean that it's implemented in a version of CHARM, but probably the one that's going through the commercial package, because it's still not quite such a big field yet. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah, all right. Nasty question. Okay. Uh, yeah, those, uh, in, in general, most people do, uh, in, in particularly with these coarse grade models, a much better job with the alpha helices. The beta sheets uh, are another uh, more difficult problem. They are more non-local. Uh, it turns out the ones that give rise to the anti-parallel beta sheets, one can do reasonably well. It's the anti-parallel one, because that already means a much further, did I say anti-parallel? Sorry, parallel beta sheets because you've meandered, you know, just to do a sharp turn and come back, you can, those are, it, although non-local, they're less non-local than the ones where you have to tra do a larger traverse and then get back to get the things, the two strands running uh, parallel. Uh, we can achieve that to some degree of success as, as other people do because in our hydrogen bond term, uh, it does turn out there is a slightly different interaction that is there for hydrogen bonds that are formed between two strands that are parallel versus anti-parallel. If you look at it in the eye, with the eyes of an organic chemist, you'll see that there are two ring structures that are formed, and they're not the same ring structures, uh, and you can exploit that um, to sort of give uh, a, a slight boost to one over the other, and that was the major improvement and being able to uh, to treat uh, uh, parallel as well as anti-parallel strain. But it's still, uh, the we are less confident with those. We tend to get the ordering of the strands often incorrect. Mm -hmm. uh, in mm-hmm. You know, um, that, that's an interesting question, and, and as I say, I think you need to answer it by asking what's the goal of your calculation. Now, I have not done a calculation with a polarizable force field. Uh, uh, Friesner 
um, has been really, le in his company with Schrodinger, has been really leading the, the effort uh, or they're making the loudest noise that it, it needs to be done. I think there was a, a certain degree of maybe a, a hope and perhaps some justification that if you just do a little bit better job of the parameterization of um, uh, doing higher quantum chemistry calculations, better assignment of the charges, that a lot of these issues could be uh, diverted. But as in most things, if you look at any one of those force fields, amber, charm, and the people who are developing it, they have efforts going on on all levels. Like they too, uh, like, like charm has a, an effort to combine coarse grain lattice Monte Carlo calculations of Jess Skolnick with the charm force field so they can exploit that avenue, right? Um, Amber felt like, okay, we can't be sitting here not prepared to go in that direction if there are more and more problems that need to be addressed with a polarizable force field, right? But there are a number of interesting problems, I think, that can be ad uh, addressed right now using the force fields as they are, provided when you have something new, you don't put garbage in, right? Um, but that's, you know, they've kept evolving. The fact that, uh, you know, like was Todd made this comment, like maybe everything was parameterized a long time ago on a very minimal basis set, which was very stupid, right? And Peter Coleman liked to tell the story about when they first started out, they, they had enormous deviations in their simulations from crystal structures, right? And nowadays, maybe, uh, and now they're much better at that. And, and uh, uh, so I, I think it's a natural course of things. So, you know, you use what you can now, but be only ask the questions that are reasonable. If you're really interested in, in what goes on as that chemical bond is made or broken, then you have to use QMMM. Right? I think there's just no way around it. 